Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. It is time for Unearthed this time for the episode that's just going to close out the last three months of 2023, even though it is now 2024. If you're new to the show, uh, this is when a few times a year we take a look at things that have been literally or figuratively unearthed over the last few months. So this is October, November, and December of 2023. We will be kicking it off with a whole, whole lot of updates to prior episodes of the show, including some updates on things that have come up on Unearthed before. Uh, We also, in today's episode, have some things that were dug up in the garden and some edibles and potables, which are not from the garden, (laughs) and uh, some books and letters. And then on Wednesday, we'll have some other perennial favorites like shipwrecks and artwork. Uh, Those will all be next time. So back in 2014, we did a full episode on Stonehenge after non-invasive imaging revealed a lot of previously unknown monuments and other structures under the surface there. Of course, there has been other research at the site since then, some of which we have covered on subsequent installments of Unearthed. This year, one team is focused on Stone 80, which is known as the Altar Stone, leading to a paper published in the Journal of Archaeological Science titled, The Stonehenge Altar Stone Was Probably Not Sourced from the Old Red Sandstone of the Anglo-Welsh Basin. Time to broaden our geographic and stratigraphic horizons? That whole thing is the paper's title. It is. Um, It amuses me as a title because it is just structurally dissimilar from a lot of paper titles. You don't usually have a complete sentence followed by a complete sentence question (laughs) as the the title of the paper. They're borrowing from old school title style. Yeah, Yeah, kind of. So in this paper, researchers used several methods to analyze the altar stone, and this included optical petrography, X-ray fluorescence, and scanning electron microscope and energy dispersive X-ray spectrography. And they found that this stone has a higher barium content than most of the other stones at the site. And then as that paper title suggests, the stone was believed to have originated from the Anglo-Welsh Basin. There are some stones from that basin that have a similar barium content to the altar stone, but those do not have the same mineral content as the altar stone, so they're kind of not an exact match. This suggests that this stone may have come from somewhere else, possibly farther north in Britain, and possibly from sandstone deposits that are younger than this roughly 400-million-year-old old red sandstone formation of West Wales. I did not realize how challenging old red sandstone was going to be to say. (laughs) (laughs) To shift gears and expand on something we briefly mentioned in our recent two-parter on Indigenous writer Morning Dove, research into fossilized footprints in White Sands National Park in New Mexico has been ongoing over the last couple of years. In 2021, a paper titled Evidence of Humans in North America During the Last Glacial Maximum was published in the journal Science, and it described these footprints as having been made between 21,000 and 23,000 years ago. So this 2021 research was controversial for a few reasons. Within the field of archaeology, one of the prevailing hypotheses about the arrival of humans in the Americas is known as Clovis I. And that's basically that the culture known as the Clovis people was the first to inhabit North America, and that started roughly 13,000 years ago. So there was already archaeological research suggesting that humans were in the Americas before that point, But this 10,000-year difference between 13,000 years and 23,000 years from this paper, that seemed really dramatic. There were also archaeologists who expressed some skepticism about the conclusions because this research was based on radiocarbon dating of aquatic plant seeds in what is now rock but had been a lake bed. So if the seeds had absorbed carbon from the water, 
that could have thrown off the accuracy of this carbon dating. In addition to that, indigenous scholars and critics pointed out that this research and the reporting around it didn't really acknowledge any connection between these footprints and the indigenous peoples of North America. Although the National Park Service's news release described the research as done, quote, in connection with the park's Native American partners, this wasn't reflected in the text of the paper or in reporting from major news outlets like the New York Times. There wasn't a suggestion that these footprints were made by the ancestors of indigenous people living today, or that the results affirmed indigenous nations' own histories about how long they've been on the continent. Saponi tribe member Nick Martin, writing for High Country News, described it this way, quote, anyone who read only mainstream coverage would walk away without a clue that this is actually an indigenous story, not merely a triumphant discovery of capital S science. Not a single indigenous citizen, historian, elder, story holder, biologist, geneticist, or archaeologist was quoted in the piece. Nor did the word indigenous or native appear once. Martin also cited Cremate archaeologist Paulette Stevens, whose book The Indigenous Paleolithic of the Western Hemisphere details archaeological sites that date back farther than 23,000 years, sometimes much farther But a lot of this news reporting really made the newly published paper's conclusions sound almost unprecedented. New research published in October supports the conclusions from the 2021 paper, this time using carbon dating of ancient pollen grains, as well as a technique called optically stimulated luminescence, which estimates the age of the quartz in the sediment layers. This research was again published in the journal Science under the title Independent Age Estimates Resolve the Controversy of Ancient Human Footprints at White Sands. There have been archaeologists who have pointed out that seeds, pollen, and quartz luminescence all have downsides for use in dating. But now there are three different sources of data all pointing to the same basic time period. So this paper's acknowledgments begin, quote, science is a way of knowing, and we acknowledge that there are many ways of knowing. Therefore, we deeply appreciate the perspectives, cultural practices, and oral histories of the tribes and pueblos whose homeland is in southern New Mexico. This time around, the New York Times quoted Edward Jolie, who is an enrolled citizen of the Muscogee Creek Nation of Oklahoma and also has Oglala Lakota ancestry. Jolie said in part, quote, It's another one of those, we told you so. A lot of natives have said, we've always been here. NPR also quoted Jolie as saying, quote, given that the vast majority of archaeology in the Americas is the archaeology of Native Americans, it's particularly significant that Native voices, Indigenous voices, have become more prominent and more accepted. So I feel like this is a step forward from the first paper and how it was reported on But I still would not call this, like, a collaborative or indigenous-led project. Right. Uh, Moving on, we did an episode on the 1918 flu pandemic in 2014. And then, again, a year into the COVID-19 pandemic, we revisited that topic through the lens of what we had all been living through. One of the things we mentioned in both of those episodes was that the 1918 flu pandemic disproportionately killed young, otherwise healthy people— unlike many infectious diseases that are more likely to be fatal to the very old, the very young, and people who have illnesses or certain disabilities. That's been a widely repeated description of the 1918 pandemic, but research published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in October calls that into question. So this research was based on analysis of the skeletons of 369 people from the Hammontod Documented Osteological Collection in Cleveland, Ohio. The researchers divided the bones that they were examining into a control group, people who had died before the pandemic, and then the group that died during the pandemic. The skeleton's shin bones were examined for lesions that would indicate some kind of environmental, social, or nutritional stress. The researchers concluded that the people who had active lesions were, to use their terminology, frail, and that they were more likely to die during the pandemic. 
they concluded that there wasn't clear evidence that the 1918 flu disproportionately killed young, healthy people. It was true that the people who cared for patients during the flu and reported their deaths saw a lot more young adults dying than during other disease outbreaks. But according to this research, pre-existing medical conditions and socioeconomic factors played a role in their deaths. In other words, they may have been young, but they were not necessarily healthy. There are some limits to this research, though. The skeletons in the Hammond Todd collection are all from people who died in Cleveland. Most of them died in places like prisons, charity hospitals, poor houses, and tuberculosis clinics, and then their bodies were unclaimed. So that's a very specific population of people. It is not really clear whether these results would apply to the population more broadly. And this also doesn't really explain why the 1918 flu was disproportionately more lethal among young adults compared to other epidemics. Because people do tend to develop more conditions that can place more stress on their bodies as they get older. As just a side note, this collection has come up on the show before. It was developed by Carl A. Haman and Thomas W. Todd. Past podcast subject W. Montague Cobb studied under Todd at Western Reserve University and worked with this collection. We will take a quick sponsor break, and then we will come back for a few more updates. In 2011, prior hosts of the show did an episode on the 1911 Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, which killed almost 150 workers, most of them young women, in New York City. There was not much to commemorate this fire until October of last year, when a new memorial was dedicated at the site where the fire took place. This memorial has text in English, Yiddish, and Italian, which are the languages that were spoken by the workers who died there, And then there's also a stainless steel ribbon mounted about 12 feet above the sidewalk on two sides of the building. Those ribbons list the names of 146 victims of the fire, and the names are cut through the steel, so they reflect on this dark panel that's below that. Uh, As I understand it, I think there's a second part of this memorial that is still in the works. Moving on, in autumn of 2022, we talked about the discovery of an iron folding chair that was found in a burial site. This chair dates back to the 6th century, and at the time, it was removed from the site as part of a whole block of soil. It has now been fully excavated from that block. The Bavarian State Office for Monument Preservation conducted the excavation, as well as an analysis of the chair, which found that it had previously undetected brass inlays as decoration. When we first talked about this chair, it was believed to have been buried as a mark of status for the person it was buried with, or maybe a mark of political office. That continues to be true. This is a woman's burial site, and we don't really know much about her, but she seems to have been very high status Uh, Also, this chair, it just looks like an iron frame, if you look at pictures of it, kind of an X-shaped iron frame. The seat has not survived until today, but there are traces left on the iron that suggest it was made from animal fur. In April of 2016, we did an episode on Denmark's early history and the Yelling Stones. These rune stones were part of research that was published in the journal Antiquity this past fall. This research used 3D scanning to study the inscriptions on the Yelling Stone and another set of rune stones called the Ravnung Two Stones. Both sets of rune stones mention a woman called Thyra. The Yelling Stones were raised by King Harold Bluetooth to commemorate his parents, Gorm and Thyra, so we know who that Thyra is. But it wasn't clear whether the Thyra mentioned in the Ravnung Two Stones was the same person. The team's analysis of the stone's shapes and carving techniques suggest that the same person carved at least one each of the Yelling Stones and the Ravnunj two stones, so they concluded that the Thyra mentioned in the two different stones were probably the same person. If that is the case, then she was mentioned more than any other person in rune stones from Viking Age Denmark, meaning that she was probably very powerful and important. So last time we did Unearthed, we talked about the discovery that more than a thousand items were missing from the collection of the British Museum. 
As of reporting in mid-December, only about 350 of them had been recovered. Nearly all of the recovered items came from the antiquities dealer who first warned the museum that items were being stolen back in 2021. There were also another 350 items in the museum's collection that were discovered to be missing gold mounts or gemstones It's likely that most of those will not be recovered because they were sold, and in case of the gold mounts, were just melted down and sold as scrap. Next, the CERN giant made an appearance on Unearthed in July of 2021. That is the enormous chalk figure of a naked man carrying a knotted club on a hillside in Dorset, England. At the time, researchers were trying to figure out how old it was, and that research wound up involving microscopic snails. These researchers estimated that the oldest chalk layers dated to between the years 700 and 1100. They did not find evidence to suggest who made the figure, why, or what it is meant to represent. New research published last year builds on that earlier study and suggests some answers to those questions. The team concluded that the giant marked a muster site for the armies of King Alfred and was originally meant to represent the mythical figure of Hercules. And then later on, monks at Cern Abbas reinterpreted it as a representation of St. Eadwald. Alfred lived in the 9th century, which aligns with that earlier research on the age of the chalk layers. And researchers pointed out several similarities between classical depictions of Hercules and the CERN giant, including the knotted club, his nakedness, and the fact that Hercules was often depicted in motion. And that chalk figure looks like he's walking. They described various written references to Hercules in the early Middle Ages, and they pointed out how CERN's location, proximity to water and shelter, and proximity to known Viking raiding sites made it an ideal muster point for an army. As is the case, a lot of the time, a lot of the reports on this research made it sound like this is the conclusive solving of a mystery. This is really, as the paper itself makes clear, a possible explanation based on available evidence. In the words of Thomas Morcom, a researcher at the University of Oslo in one of the paper's articles, quote, I think we found a compelling narrative that fits the giant into the local landscape and history better than ever before, changing him from an isolated mystery to an active participant in the local community and culture. Also, I realized after I wrote this entire piece, that it's technically something I should have saved for the first unearthed installment of 2024, but oh well, no one really cares. You're going me. to unearth jail, <laughs> um, which I have to now build. Thanks a lot, Tracy. Um, <laughs> in November, the U.S. Mint unveiled a new quarter featuring past podcast subject Maria Tallchief. That was part of the American Women Quarters program. These quarters all feature the head of George Washington shown in profile on the obverse with the women on the reverse. Tall Chief's coin shows her in a balletic leap with both her English and Osage names, with her Osage name written in Osage orthography. A past podcast subject, Nina Otero Warren, was also featured on one of these quarters back in 2022, which I did not know about until just now. Uh, Forthcoming quarters that are planned through 2025 include past subjects Mary Edwards Walker, Ida B. Wells, and Juliet Gordon Lowe. And in our last update, the N.C. Wyeth illustration that somebody bought for $4 at a Savers in New Hampshire, which we talked about in our previous installment of Unearthed, continued to make news in Q4. It sold at auction for $191,000 in September, but the buyer never paid the auction house and the seller had to reclaim it. But... In December, the illustration was successfully sold to a private buyer for more than $100,000. Moving on, we have three finds that were found out in the garden. First, a metal detectorist found some bronze discs in a newly harvested carrot field in northeastern Switzerland over the summer and notified archaeologists about them. They then worked with the landowner to get permission to cut a block of soil out of this carrot field and take it to the lab, where they wound up finding more of these discs, along with two spiral finger rings and more than 100 amber beads that were so tiny they had to be picked out of the soil with tweezers. 
The discs were probably part of a necklace, and the team also found some gold spirals separate from those finger rings that might have been spacers in between the discs when it was worn as a necklace. All this dates back to about 1500 BCE. They also found some things that weren't jewelry, including a beaver tooth, a bear tooth, and a shark tooth, as well as bits of ore and crystal, an arrowhead, and an ammonite fossil. It's possible that they and the necklace were all intentionally buried. An article in Smithsonian Magazine describes them as possibly someone's collection of curiosities, or things that were worn together as a protective amulet. Next, a family on the island of Jomfreland in southern Norway was using a metal detector to try to find a lost earring in their garden, when they instead found two 9th century brooches under a tree. One was oval-shaped and was a style that was often worn as part of a pair, but the other one is not the match to that one. It is circular and matches a style that was known to have been used in Denmark sometime around 780 to 850 CE. It is possible that these items came from a burial site and that the match to the oval pin, along with other grave goods or possibly remains, they might be found with some further excavation. According to an article in Artnet News, this is the earliest conclusive evidence that Jomfrelin was actually settled in the ninth century. This last one, before we take a break, starts out in a garden, but then moves beyond it. The National Museums of Scotland published work in the Proceedings of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland in November detailing discoveries that were made back in the 1950s and 60s. The first was in 1952, when a schoolboy in Fife was assigned to dig potatoes in the school garden as a punishment. In addition to the potatoes, he found a 4,000-year-old Egyptian statue head made from sandstone. The statue head was sent to the Royal Scottish Museum, which is now the National Museums of Scotland, and at the time, people thought this was a really unexpected but isolated find. Yeah, they seem to have kind of gone, wow, that's weird, and then moved on. (laughs) Uh, this school was located at a historic building called Melville House. And in 1966, another student there was vaulting during P.E. class and landed on part of a bronze votive statue of an apis bull that was sticking out of the ground. And what was really just a wild coincidence, the teacher who was supervising this P.E. class was the boy that had dug up the sandstone head out of the ground in 1952, Uh, He apparently left the school with this statuette, which was never recovered. The school eventually closed, and the Fife Regional Council purchased Melville House to use as a residential school for children with behavioral issues or who had been convicted of a crime. In 1984, a group of teens took yet another find to the National Museum of Scotland, this time an ancient Egyptian figurine of a man made from bronze. It was at this point where people were like, okay, something's going on here. (laughs) What's under the Melville School? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, After finally getting some more specific information about exactly where this statue had been found, the museum did a more thorough investigation, and they found a number of other Egyptian objects buried there. The crown claimed the figurine and other finds from the former school site as a treasure trove, They are now in the museum's collections, and this seems to be the only collection of Egyptian objects to be declared a treasure trove in Scotland. It's not entirely clear where these objects came from or why they were buried at Melville House, but one possibility is that Alexander, Lord Balgoni, who had inherited the property, acquired them during a visit to Egypt in 1856. He took that trip to try to improve his health, but he died of tuberculosis in 1857. It's possible that his relatives buried these things because the memories of him they invoked were painful, or because they thought they were cursed, which was a commonly held superstition in Britain in the 19th century. Yeah, that superstition was not held only in Britain, obviously, but that was sort of a thing that a lot of non-Egyptian people thought about things that had been brought out of Egyptian tombs. Uh, We'll take a quick sponsor break before we talk about edibles and potables. Next! 
Next, we have some edibles and potables. First, research using dental calculus, or tartar, suggests that people in a lot of Western Europe regularly used seaweed as a food source for thousands of years. Researchers evaluated samples from the teeth of 74 people taken from 28 archaeological sites. Those sites stretched from southern Spain to northern Scotland. And they found evidence that people made seaweed, pondweed, and other similar aquatic plants a regular part of their diets from roughly 6400 BCE to the 12th century CE. This is interesting because while seaweed is part of the cuisine in other parts of the world, especially parts of Asia, it has not been as associated with food from Europe in the modern era, at least until very recently. Instead, most archaeological evidence suggested that Europeans were using seaweed and similar plants to make things like fertilizer and fuel. It seems that by the 18th century, most people in Europe saw seaweed as something to be eaten only in times of famine, not as an everyday staple. Yeah, unless I missed it, I don't think this paper speculated on why seaweed fell out of favor as a food source, but uh, I found that interesting, especially since now you can go buy some real expensive seaweed chips or whatever. Right? <laughs> Improved agriculture would be my <laughs> guess, but... Uh, this is what, That makes this next one kind of like tangentially related because next, according to research published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Early farmers who settled on the Baltic coast about 6,000 years ago may have included fish in their diets. This research involves studying the fat residues and pottery fragments, and about half of the fragments belonging to early farmers contained residues from fish. This probably doesn't sound all that surprising since fish would have been an available food source. But previous research examining prehistoric cooking pots has suggested that people in Britain, Spain, France, and Portugal stopped fishing once they started farming. And this included people living in coastal areas. But this research suggested that farmers who arrived on the coast stretching from what's now western Denmark to southern Finland instead learned fishing techniques from hunter-gatherers who were already living there. In the words of Professor Oliver Craig, director of the BioArc Lab at the University of York, quote, while this might seem like an obvious and logical strategy, it is in significant contrast to virtually all other early Neolithic sites that are located in coastal areas, where we see no evidence that they made use of marine resources. Craig also noted that there did not seem to be a lot of intermarriage between the two groups, between like the newcomer farmers and the existing hunter-gatherers. And that might have provided some kind of explanation for why this community kind of adopted fishing when other coastal uh, farming communities did not. Uh, Another surprising find, they thought, was that about 5% of the hunter-gatherer community's pots contained dairy residues, suggesting they had some kind of access to dairy prior to transitioning to farming and presumably keeping domesticated animals that produce milk. Moving on, researchers in Puerto Rico have used plant DNA extracted from coprolites to study the diets of two pre-Columbian Caribbean communities, the huecoid culture and the saladoid culture. The coprolites, which are basically mummified poop, suggest that both communities ate a diverse variety of foods, including sweet potatoes, both wild and domesticated peanuts, peppers, papaya, and maize. There was also evidence of the consumption of edible fungus, including huetlacoche, which grows on corn. The team also found residues from two plants that might not be thought of as food. Those were tobacco and cotton. The team proposed several possible explanations for why these people would have had tobacco and cotton in their feces, like they may have chewed tobacco or added it to food for medicinal or ritual reasons, or the residues may be a side effect of crushing and inhaling tobacco. The cotton may have come from grinding cotton seeds for oil or from wetting strands of cotton in the mouth while using the cotton for weaving or other crafts. Although a number of chronicles have described people in the Caribbean using cassava as a staple food, there wasn't evidence of that in these samples. 
It's possible that the steps needed to process cassava root into an edible food degraded its DNA to the point that it could no longer be detected in these coprolites, or it may have been eaten more seasonally and these samples were produced at the wrong time of year. There's a lot of pounding and grinding and and drying involved in that process, and so the idea was maybe there just wasn't a lot of DNA left, especially after all these centuries have passed. So... Aside from the fact that coprolites can only show what a person was eating during one relatively small window of time, this research also involved comparing the DNA from the coprolites to contemporary plant DNA. So it's possible that there was also DNA from other plants that just isn't in this modern database. The team also compared the coprolites to feces from modern people living in Mexico, Peru, and the United States, which suggested that present-day hunter-gatherers had a similar diet to those living in pre-Columbian Puerto Rico. And to close off the edible and potables, we have two finds that are related to wine. The first is 5,000-year-old wine discovered at the tomb of Meritneith in Abydos, Egypt. Archaeologists found hundreds of wine jars many of them still intact and some of them still sealed. Some of the vessels also contained well-preserved grape seeds. Queen Merit Knight lived during Egypt's first dynasty, and according to researchers, the wine and other grave goods found in this tomb suggest that she may have been Egypt's first pharaoh. She was definitely a powerful woman. Abydos was Egypt's first royal cemetery, and Merit Neith is the only woman known to have her own monumental tomb there. This tomb is part of a complex that also includes the tombs of 41 of the queen's servants and courtiers, and inscriptions in the tomb complex state that Merit Neith was responsible for central government offices, including the treasury. Beyond that, though, we currently know very little about her or her life. Yeah, there's, I would say it's not conclusively agreed that she could have been Egypt's first pharaoh. There are some that are like, well, she, clearly she was very powerful, but like not to the point of being a pharaoh. Uh, this tomb has also raised some questions around the idea of human sacrifice and the burials of Egyptian royals during the first dynasty. So in a lot of tombs that we know about, it appears that the ruler's retainers were killed and buried along with them to serve them in the afterlife. But in this tomb... The tombs of the servants and the courtiers seem to have been built at different times over a longer period, so not all at once when she was entombed. So it suggests more that, you know, perhaps people died of other causes and then were entombed or something else was going on. Our other wine discovery is a Roman-era winery found along a river in southern France that happened during excavations for a parking lot at a factory. This winery is nearly 2,000 years old, with a raised platform for pressing grapes, flanked by basins to collect the juice. There's also a three-room building that was probably used for fermentation and storage. The floors still have impressions from the large vessels that would have been used to store the wine. And now we will close out today's episode with books and letters. First, a box of undelivered letters from the Seven Years' War has been in the UK's National Archives, and they were opened and read for the first time in 2023. This was three stacks of letters tied in ribbon, most of them sealed with wax, and they were addressed to men serving aboard the French warship Galate. The ship was captured by the British in 1758, and the French Postal Administration tried to direct these letters to various ports, sort of hoping to catch up with the ship before learning of the ship's capture. The letters were ultimately intercepted and confiscated. This work was spearheaded by Renaud Morieux, who was working on a book and got permission to open the letters. About a quarter of the men stationed aboard the Galette had a letter in this collection, and more than half of the letters were signed by women. Some letters were written by the women themselves, and others were written by scribes. Many turned out to mostly be love letters, written by the men's wives or fiancés or companions. Others were from parents or siblings. Some of them sort of chronicle some drama over several letters sent by different people. Uh, This next one came to us from listener Megan, who sent us a link about the discovery of a 318-year-old Scottish Bible in Iowa. 
Kathy Magruder, who runs a bookstore in Indianola, was going through the library in a retirement home in Des Moines when she found this Bible. The retirement home had realized that there were a lot of books in their library that were never being checked out, and they had given Magruder the opportunity to just go through them and make an offer on any of them that she might want. The title page of this Bible said that it had been printed in 1605, which Magruder quickly realized could not be true since it was a King James Bible, and that edition of the Bible was first printed in 1611. After further research and consulting with a rare books expert, she learned that the title page had a known misprint and that it was from 1705, not 1605. According to news reports, the Bible was also printed without oversight from the church, that would have been illegal. It's really not clear at this point how the Bible wound up in the library at the retirement home. None of the home's residents uh, have shared the names of the people that are mentioned in a family history that was included among the pages of the Bible. Magruder ultimately sold this Bible to another Indianola resident. Our last letter find is a bit of a journey. In 2013, archaeological curator Sarah Rivers Cofield found a silk bustle dress at an antique mall in Maine. After buying it and getting it home, she found a concealed pocket, one that seemed a lot harder to get at than typical pockets in Victorian-era dresses. Once she got into that pocket, she found a couple of pieces of paper. The notes on the paper seemed to be written in some kind of code, saying things like spring, wilderness, lining, one, reading, novice. There were also lines in a different color that seemed like they were checking off each line of code, as well as some notes in the margin that looked like times of day, like 10 p.m. Obviously, this was intriguing. Yeah, she posted about this in her blog, and she said it was, quote, in case there's some decoding prodigy out there looking for a project. People figured out pretty quickly that this seemed like it had to be some kind of telegraph code, and then eventually Wayne Chan, an analyst with the Center for Earth Observation Science at the University of Manitoba, made the connection that it was a weather code. Eventually, a librarian at NOAA's Central Library in Silver Spring, Maryland, sent Chan a PDF of a weather code book published by the USDA Weather Bureau in 1892. With that as a starting point, Chan finally figured out that this was a code that had been used by the Army Signal Service Corps, which eventually became the National Weather Service. We talked about the evolution of the Signal Service Corps in our 2016 episode on the schoolhouse blizzard. The string of words were the station location, followed by code words for temperature and barometric pressure, dew point, precipitation and wind direction, cloud cover and wind velocity, and sunset observations. Chan's work on this was printed in the journal Cryptologia. There is still some mystery around these papers, though. It seems like they were written by somebody working with the Signal Service Corps in 1888, The codes on those papers align with specific observations that are on record from May of that year. But there's also a label sewn into the dress that has the name Bennett. There were women on the clerical staff at the Service Corps' D.C. office, but none of those women were named Bennett. There was a man named Maitland Bennett, and it's possible that his wife helped him in his work, but she would have been about eight months pregnant when these notations were made. It is not totally impossible that this dress could have been worn by somebody who was eight months pregnant, kind of depending on how she was carrying and whether the dress had all of its boning in and, like, what kind of maternity corset she might have had on. At the same time, though, this is a really fitted garment. (laughs) Uh, It it doesn't seem necessarily likely that somebody eight months pregnant could have been wearing it. Um, So there's just some question marks. I sent it, I was sent the, the blog write-up about the dress to Holly. And I was like, Holly, do you think somebody eight months pregnant could have worn this? (laughs) And I was like, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It might not have been the most common, but yeah. Um, But yeah, Uh, it it wouldn't have certainly been comfortable looking at it through today's eyes, but we also have seen so many examples of evidence of women wearing very uncomfortable things to today's eyes. Yeah, it's it's there is material in the dress that could have been like let out to an extent. Um but like a, as it is sort of shown on the blog it it 
the shape does, it looks like it would have been at best very uncomfortable for most people unless it were worn differently than in the photographs, I think. Does that make sense? Yes, I think it would have been worn differently than in the photographs. Yeah. Um, Because I think if she carried low, she absolutely could have been wearing it. Yeah. Um, It just is a matter of where the waistline sat before her baby bump protruded. So it could have, because we we looked at some pictures of women who were wearing very similar garments when they were obviously pretty pregnant. Yeah. But it's like, it's it's a complete crapshoot. You don't know. We don't know what she looked like when she was pregnant, so there's no additional info. Yeah, the, some of the some of the articles that I had were like, she definitely couldn't have. And I was like, I don't think that's really how like Victorian era dresses worked. Like they, they there's a lot of material there to work with, sort of depending on somebody's body. Oh, there are like secret compartments in some of them that can move around and shift stuff out and expand and contract. Um, we could talk about that forever, but that is it for today <laughs> on Unearth. And we'll have, of course, more next time, as Tracy promised at the top. Yeah. Do you have listener mail in the meantime? I have two quick things today. Um, They are both following our uh, episode on the the Great English Sparrow War. And we talked about uh, a commitment in uh, in North America to, like, rename all the common names of birds that are named after people or are otherwise exclusionary. And I said I was not sure if there was a similar... Uh, movement in the names of other animals. To be very clear, what I was trying to say was like another organization definitively saying we are renaming all the names. Um, I definitely know that there are like our various individual animals that have been renamed and like other calls for renaming, but like uh, I, I don't know if like another organization that has said we are doing this in a broad way across all of the names. Um, so we got a couple of emails Uh, One is from Kiki, who said, Happy New Year. It was such a joy to return to work and have almost two whole weeks of backlog to listen to. I was enthralled with the English Sparrow War and extremely excited when the Starlings were mentioned. There have been lots of other names, updated names in the last decade-ish. Insects and plants and places think military installations and Mount Denali. There are two articles that talk about renaming for cultural reasons instead of just discovering species twice. So the first of these links is to a Smithsonian article um, about renaming what is now called the spongy moth. This article is actually from before that renaming. Um, It is for a moth that was previously named a slur for the Romani people. The other is an article from Scientific American that is about a call in New Zealand to make changes to animal names. Uh, And then the email goes on to say, obviously it's an ongoing issue, but we are so much farther than we were. Please find uh, attached a picture of my new coworker, obviously doing a great job at bookkeeping. Thanks, Kiki. The new coworker is a very, very cute puppy dog in a gray bed. Looks so exciting to be at work. Uh, and And the way of, lying down in just the laziest way possible in the way that I always envy my cats when I am working and they are sleeping in the most comfortable looking positions. Oh, they're such jerks about it too. They're like, oh, work, really? Look. They are. Mm -hmm. Opal (laughs) has started doing a thing where she yells at me and what she wants me to do is come back to bed. And I'm like, I'm working, Opal. I cannot (laughs) come back to bed. Um, so the other email we got was from Rachel. Rachel said, hi, Tracy and Holly. As usual, I'm a week behind with a podcast. However, today, when listening to the behind the scenes for the English Sparrow episode, Tracy mentioned that she knew there was a move to rename birds that were named after people. She also mentioned that she didn't know if it was happening to any other animals. Here's a link to a recent New York Times article that answers that question. Hope you haven't received this numerous times already. Thanks for all you do. I learned so much for the shows over the many years I've been listening. Rachel, thank you, Rachel. No one had sent this article to me. So this article is a little bit different. It is about a call to to look at the scientific names. Like, we had been talking mostly about common names, um, but these are, like, the scientific genus and species names um, named after, in this case, Hitler. And there's actually been a whole big back and forth, some of it, after that episode was recorded 
um, about the the like International Commission on Zoological Nomenclature, which oversees a lot of this internationally, uh, basically saying it would be really disruptive if uh, we just renamed all of this, this stuff for cultural reasons. And then other people saying, no, it really wouldn't be. So this is obviously still ongoing. So thank you very much, Rachel and Kiki, for these emails. If you would like to send us a note about this or any other podcast or history podcast at iHeartRadio.com, and you can subscribe to our show on the iHeartRadio app or wherever else you like to get your podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.